Praise the Lord. I am Suffragan Bishop Harold Rayford, the senior pastor of the Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith. We're located at 1200 Brentnell Avenue in Columbus, Ohio. Welcome to our Holy Week celebration. As you know, Holy Week is more than just the week before Easter. It is a week that begins with a commemoration of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem just before his crucifixion and his resurrection. To, today, this week at the Church of Christ, we have made it our concern to make sure that this week is commemorated properly. Although there are things that we would normally do this week, but were unable to do due to the pandemic, we thought that we should make sure to have some good teaching this week in addition to other special events. Tonight, you're going to hear from one of the dynamic teachers that we have been blessed to have here at the Church of Christ. The teacher for tonight is one of the dynamic associate ministers, evangelist Donna Good. Praise the Lord. I'm coming to you from the Church of Christ of the Apostolic Faith, where Suffragan Bishop Harold Rayford is pastor. I'm Evangelist Good, and my assignment of teaching today is on forgiveness. I will try to give you time to follow along, or at least write the scriptures down, or for reading them later. I have incorporated them into my notes for brevity. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, in the name of Jesus, we stand before you, Lord God, as a needy people. You know the conditions throughout the land, Father, and we trust you, Lord God, that all that you have allowed to take place is for our betterment. We thank you for this opportunity to come before you to proclaim the whole council, Lord God, to give your word. I pray, Father, that you will be glorified in everything that we discuss. This is your word, Lord, and all that are the redeemed of the Lord say so. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. My assignment again is forgiveness. God planned for our forgiveness long before we were even created. In the book of Genesis, again, my scriptures are here. Uh, so if you'll follow along in your Bibles, hopefully you have your Bibles here. Genesis 3 and 15. And I will put enmity, enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The plan for our forgiveness started in the Garden of Eden when both Adam and Eve fell from grace. Yet they found mercy when God himself shed the blood, blood of an innocent animal to cover their sin of disobedience with the skins of that animal. Soon thereafter, God cursed the serpent, who was guilty of deceiving Eve, causing both she and her husband Adam to disobey God. So God's plan of forgiveness was mentioned at the very outset of scripture again. God planned the redemption of all the seed of the woman. Eventually her seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be our redeemer. Through God's perfect plan, once and for all, we too have been redeemed and forgiven. Before forgiveness, we, his children, were rejected, condemned, wicked, in darkness, lost, in bondage. We were slaves, alienated, cursed, and found guilty. After forgiveness, we were accepted of God, righteous, free. We're now redeemed. We've been reconciled, blessed. We're now joint heirs with Christ and sons of God. 
I must not go further before saying out loud that Jesus paid the price for our freedom. Jesus endured the penalty of our guilt with his life by his blood, and we have been forgiven. Now we have the power to forgive ourselves. I must, I must also point out no matter what modern studies say, what websites say, what commentaries say, there is one unforgivable sin. It is found in Luke chapter 12, verse number 10. It reads, and this is Jesus speaking. If you had the red letter edition of your Bible, this scripture will be in red. Again, it's Luke chapter 12, verse number 10. Jesus speaking says, and whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. In Genesis 3, God pointed directly to the cross by which the plan of redemption would be accomplished. Jesus Christ and his finished work would crush the head of the serpent the enemy of all mankind. The cross would symbolize forgiveness for all those who believed. That excruciating cross comes from two Latin words, ex e ex and cruciatus, meaning out of the cross. Crucifixion was the defining word for the ultimate in pain. Being forgiven cost our Christ excruciating pain. So, wearing a cross for some has become a form of worldly trending. We have seen very vulgar, dark artists arrive at the award show podium with huge bejeweled crosses, right? Many start their thank you speeches by saying, first I wanna thank my Lord and my Savior Jesus Christ leaving many of us scratching our heads. In most churches throughout the world, the cross has been and still is a symbol of forgiveness. Crosses can be seen on steeples, on walls, on tables, as statues, and hung around the necks of Christians. Most of us wear a cross as an expression of identifying with Christ. Yes, Christ gave his life for me, and I believe in him. But do I wear a cross to express the dual meaning and the requirement for me to exhibit Christ's likeness? Am I telling all those who see me, who know me, work with me, love me, and fellowship with me that I am like Christ? I'm ready to forgive. Our cross indeed is one knot with Jesus Christ still affixed to it? He is no longer on that cross. He himself said from that cross, it is finished. He sent his Holy Spirit to help us accomplish this same spiritual work, which is spiritually to die daily. In Luke chapter 9, verse number 23, Again, that's Luke chapter 9, verse number 23. And he, Jesus said to all, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The Bible beginning in the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament has much to say and stories to tell, both of forgiveness and unforgiveness with its penalty. I have chosen stories in the Bible we all should know in a way that points to the humanity of even the chosen of God. In 2 Samuel chapter 14, verses 25 through 33, King David forgives his son Absalom. Many times people excite the uh, rhetoric with, with regard to David and how he forgave Saul. Uh, especially the house of Saul where Mephibosheth is um, the one who is blessed by David 
as a result of him wanting to go and be a blessing to Saul's lineage. However, many overlook what Absalom did to his father, King David. So I'll start reading in verse number 25, and I'll finish verse number 26. The rest has been, as I said at the outset, condensed so that for the brevity of the message. But in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. For the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he pulled his head, for it was at every year's end that he pulled it, because a hair was heavy on him, therefore he pulled it, cut it, took it off. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's white, uh, weight, the Bible says. Today, that would be about five or six pounds. That's some hair. Now, David's son, Absalom, had a beautiful sister named Tamar and another brother, Amnon, her half-brother, that actually violated her. He raped her. David was angry, but essentially did nothing. Two years later, Absalom exacted revenge of Tamar's rape by murdering her half-brother, Amnon, and then fled to his grandfather in another land. Two years later, Absalom was allowed to return home in the land where his father existed, but only to his own home. He was not allowed to see King David, his father. He asked Joab, David's commander, twice to ask David for audience. Joab would not. Absalom then had servants burn Joab's field, meaning Absalom made an enemy. When at last King David summoned Absalom, he came and bowed before the king, and the king kissed him. Remind you of another story? He was forgiven. Later, Absalom led a rebellion against the king, his father, and attempted to take over as king in place of his father. Absalom was killed in the final battle of that rebellion, and when someone brought the news to David, the king was overcome with emotion. Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, the Bible says, if only I had died instead of you, there is forgiveness again. It was Joab, by the way, who killed Absalom. We all know the story. His mane got caught in a tree. His beast ran out from under him, and he hung there. Later, he was speared to death. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 8, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Our Bible interpretation, the word charity, means love. There is none greater, our God to us. The young man David, the young man David showed strength and the ability to lead when he killed and beheaded the giant Goliath. David was indeed a powerful, highly favored king and warrior. David even crafted a hit list and verbalized it to his son Solomon nearing the end of David's life. David did like so many of us have and will, forgive the most egregious sins when it comes to our children. And like our Heavenly Father, we should. We don't condone evil, but our love for our children and our families gives us the innate ability to forgive. Let's face it, we show prejudice when loved ones offend more frequently and for far more painful offenses than those who offend us but are not related to us. Saints, we haven't a leg to stand on. The Bible has made it clear, however, that once we become the children of God, we are truly the body of Christ. We are joint heirs with Christ. We call each other sister and brother. I'm even called mother in the church now. Oh, but let one of them offend us or we offend them. 
then it becomes clear to see we have some work to do. As we enter now into the New Testament and some examples of forgiveness, again, you will recognize this. Hopefully, you will hear the voice of God through what I am expressing. Jesus himself tells this story, a roll along or a parable of the prodigal son. This is found in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Again, I use a King James Version, but I have condensed it for sake of time to get the message. Jesus himself tells this story, as I said, of the prodigal son. The prodigal son was the youngest of two sons who betrayed and wounded his father by asking for his inheritance before it was due him, which would have been uh, granted upon his father's death. His son was basically saying to his father that he could not wait until the death of his father to receive the money to go and squander it all on riotous living. The story went on to describe the never-ending hope and watch by the father for his son's return. This broken-hearted father ascended and ran to gather his broken son. I'm sorry, he repented. He saw he was going up and down, ascending his rooftop again and again, until finally he recognized his heartbroken, repentant son returning home from a long way off, the Bible says. This broken-hearted father descended and ran to gather his broken son and fell on him while covering, while covering him and protecting him with kisses of acceptance and forgiveness. The father gave up his dignity by running and was able to run, showing that he was indeed in good health. And perhaps that was the reason the son thought, I can't wait that long before I receive my inheritance. At the same time, however, the story relays the message of the older son who had no concern for his brother. He apparently knew where, he, where his brother was and he knew what his brother was doing. He should have reached out to his brother, in, if only to bring peace to the father. Instead, his jealousy for the repentant son came to the forefront. How dare father accept and restore such a wicked soul? This is a second picture of parental forgiveness. These are examples of selfish, hateful betrayal by sons against their fathers. The remorse exhibited by men of power and renown is exquisite. These men of great wealth and achievement were abased through genuine forgiving love toward their sons in spite of their wicked deeds. Jesus was explaining to, with these stories and all of the crowds that he always gathered, he was explaining what it was like for the Gentiles versus those who were self-righteous, the Pharisees and the scribes, the priests. Uh, at the same time, teaching his disciples, he taught them how to pray. They came to him and asked, how do we pray? How should we pray? And in Matthew, we all know, Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13, the prayer reads like this. Jesus said to them, pray after this manner. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debt debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This next portion of scripture is often included in the Lord's Prayer. However, it is not part of that prayer, but indeed follows immediately behind that prayer as such. So after the word amen comes verse number 14 of Matthew 6, 9 through 13. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Going forward into 
uh, the book of John, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. I have put this word for word verbatim because it brings a story about in, a, in an expedited manner. This is the adulterous woman. This is again John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they watched, they which heard it, excuse me, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The example here is that all accusing men dropped their stones. The woman now still had to face the tried stone. The only one with the power to forgive. Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. We are to be Christ's presence in the world. You will fall and he will help you get up. He will move stumbling blocks for you. We will fail, but Jesus, in Jesus, you have the victory. He simply wants us to drop our stones and forgive. This woman, caught in adultery and brought before the righteous tried stone, could have been, and by law, should have been stoned. Remember Stephen, who did no wrong? Even if she had been, she still had to face the judge of all the earth. In Matthew chapter 10, verse number 28, it says, And fear not them. Think about what we just read. Matthew 10 and 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. Going further, let's discuss God who is faithful to forgive confessed sin. The work of the cross was exacted forgiveness, spoken from that excruciating cross. Luke 23 and 34 reads, and this is Jesus speaking, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And following along in that line, Paul teaches later on in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 through 8. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. But speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Their eyes were blinded, and God allowed it to be so. In Matthew chapter 27, verse number 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, 
and the rocks rent, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many, foreshadowing. The note here is the loud cry which demonstrates that he died, Jesus died in strength, not in weakness. The fact that he yielded up his spirit distinguished his death from all others. We die because we have to. He died because he chose to. In John chapter 10, verses 17 through 18, again, this is Bible study. Therefore doth my father, this is Jesus speaking, therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I, oh glory, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. His death was a commandment, and he obeyed that commandment. In 1 John 1, uh, chapter 1, verse number 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Likewise, we must forgive. Most of the ground that Satan gains in the lives of us as Christians wrote Neil T. Anderson, is due to unforgiveness. It's a trap. Let's talk about those of us who are the redeemed of the Lord, those who have been saved through baptism in water and in spirit. We who have been filled with the Holy Ghost, his dunamis power. Where do we stand in proclaiming to be his likeness? While we wear the cross, do we also carry the cross. In other words, as the forgiven, do we forgive? Do we as a children of God faithfully seek forgiveness? Forgiveness from the Lord and then the brethren. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 3, Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 22, then came Peter to him, that being Jesus, and said, Lord, how oft shall, I, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto Peter, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. I'm sure I have exceeded that, that count many years ago, the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus. Further in this same chapter, which is Matthew 18, further down, and I have condensed it so that we can get the story clearly out, quickly out. Let's not forget the story of the unforgiving servant found in the story as Jesus told it, right after Peter asked the question of how many times are we to forgive. The story was about a servant who owed a large sum of money to his master. The master forgave him because his servant begged forgiveness. This same forgiven servant, however, did just the opposite to a fellow servant who owed him far less. When the master got word of it, the unforgiving servant was severely punished. In Mark chapter 11, verse number 25, and when ye stand praying, if we, if ye have ought against any, 
that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Over and over and over again, we are commanded to forgive like Jesus. Are we walking in unforgiveness? If so, why? Have we not heard the word? Have we not been given the strength, the Holy Ghost, and power? Have we not been made into his likeness? Please remember your forgiveness of an offender frees you. There's all kind of psychological profiles regarding forgiveness and what it does to the body. That's a whole nother story. But it is. It frees you as well as the offender. The offender still has to face the judgment of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. We, the children of God, are no longer separate, but the body of Christ. However, the biblical requirement for discipleship is love, and it is a command. In Ephesians 4 and 32, And be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Romans 12 and 19 reads, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, and he cannot lie. Perhaps if Absalom had known about the Savior and had heard this scripture and was a Christian, perhaps he would not have killed his half-brother and would have lived longer himself. But it started there. The seed of damage started right there when he killed his brother, his half-brother. Um, to, to long for justice is entirely legitimate, but to seek it for yourself is not. Let God deal with the offender in his own way at the appropriate time. He's much better at it than you or I. God will sometimes even allow us to see that vengeance. Many times the vengeance is very hard to witness. I can say for myself, many times I've turned situations over to God, and I have actually been in remorse when I saw the hand of God prevail in my defense. It is so real. So how do we seek forgiveness? James 5 and 16 tells us, we all know it, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. Saints, going to the altar for prayer is wonderful, but going to the one you offended is needful. During my employment at the state of Ohio, I had many scriptures posted to walls in my offices and cubicles as spiritual reminders and strength. In particular, I was asked to do degrading things by one female supervisor in, on, in, on several occasions. You know, those other duties as assigned, those type. I was grossly offended. Here I am, over 50 years of age, and I had someone maybe 10 years younger taking me away from the assignments she had given me to do, to do menial tasks, which I found, found to be degrading. But I went to God in prayer. God gave me the idea that since I'm always busy and she's coming into my cubicle, never asked on email, or anything like that, always coming up close and personal so that others wouldn't hear her request and she would make her request known to me. The idea God gave to me was to be busy like I always was. People at the state of Ohio really had a large uh, load of work to do. By this time, I was in a program area and she had me do these things for her. But she came into my cubicle up close and personal and whispered what she wanted me to do, and I did it. But this particular time, having prayed, I said to her, sure I will. I'm not at a breaking point right now. If you will send me an email as a reminder, as soon as I reach breaking point, I will go in and make that request. I will do that for you. So it appears to me 
She was wise enough to know that that would create a record. I never got that email, so I never did the chore. Soon thereafter, a new director came to the agency. He had the authority to keep or release all direct reports, she included. There had been past history, unbeknownst to me, between this new director and her, and it was not in her favor. She was immediately let go. But while I could have cheered and jeered and given her sarcastic looks, I did not. You never know what's going to happen in the future. And God said, vengeance is mine. We gave her one of the most phenomenal farewell parties. And of course, the state doesn't give you the finances to do those parties. We gathered and pulled our money together and gave her quite a send off. And I thank the Lord that we were able to do that because one year, almost to the day, prior to my retirement, I retired after 30 years of service. One year prior to my retirement, she came back to the agency and she was the new director. I was able to see her, speak to her, and I never, ever, ever heard anything from her. I did not report to her at that time, but I thank God that I allowed God to avenge me. Had I done something that would have been detrimental to my future, it would have been my fault, but I had grown in the Lord. I understood and had seen and witnessed so many times God took vengeance for me and on my behalf. In Luke chapter 6, verse Verses number 27 and 28, this is Jesus speaking. But I say unto you which hear, love, these are some of the scriptures, by the way, posted on my walls and in my cubicles. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. Another scripture posted for years, judge not and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. In Colossians 3 and 13, the scripture is, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. In Psalm chapter 103, verses 10 through 14, he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. That's how far our sins have been separated from us. Go on I-270. You'll never reach the north, the south, or the east or the west. It continually circles. That's what God has done. We could never reach the east or the west because of the revolving of the world. That's how far removed our sins are from us. Glory be to God. As a true and living child of God, I am grateful for the symbolism of the cross. Not only the cross we sometimes wear, but even across the cross affixed to the stones behind me, as well as a cross atop our church building. It is a reminder that you can come inside and learn of Christ. You can ask, seek, and knock, thereby receiving forgiveness of sin, no matter the nature of the sin. I recall several years ago, a 21-year-old young man full of hate entered a church and joined a Bible study group who welcomed this stranger with open arms. Before he left, nine people, including the senior pastor, were slain. This was a hate-filled crime, but I also remember the expressions of some of the survivors who uttered words of forgiveness almost immediately following the crime. They were a community who chose to forgive. Note this, while some survivors forgave him, he still had to face man's justice. Without repentance, he will face justice still. 
let us understand, and I need this as well, we are free to and are equipped to forgive much. Remember, this first and foremost, in some cases, offenders need to be brought to justice. Your forgiveness of any individual is to free you. In most instances, justice will prevail. Here on earth, if necessary, and right by mankind, and certainly always God Almighty, who told us he will repay. Take solace in knowing that God is omniscient, he's omnipotent, and he is omnipresent. That case is closed. We are the true body of Christ. We indeed have suffered hurt and injury, and some of us have caused injury. Because of the Bible, the word of God, and the manifested body of Christ, we must get things right. As others have, and the word says, we must get our houses in order. In Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, it reads, Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. Did you hear that? He delights in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. By the way, when it comes to forgiveness of sin, there is no term see a forgetfulness in our Bible. If the offender must apologize before I forgive, then forgiving can be impossible. Yet yourself, set yourself free from those boundaries. In many instances, forgiveness comes sometimes after the offender is no longer alive. There is still forgiveness, however. The intermediary is Jesus Christ. Let this be a lesson to us all. Our forgiveness on this side of, this, of the baptism in water and receiving the Holy Ghost relies on our forgiveness of the brethren. It's hard, but it's fair. I ran into, as I was doing my studies, a beautiful poem which expresses the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he gave his life for us, the, the poem is from F.W. Pitt, and it reads, The maker of the universe, as man for man, was made a curse. The claims of law which he had made, unto the uttermost he paid. His holy fingers made the bow, which grew the thorns that crowned his brow. The nails that pierced his hand were mined in secret places, he designed. He made the forest from whence there sprung the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood, yet made the hill on which it stood, the sky that darkened o'er his head. By him above the earth was spread, the sun that hid from him its face. By his decree was poised in space, the spear which spilled his precious blood, was tempered in the fires of God. The grave in which his form was laid was hewn in rocks his hands had made. The throne on which he, he now appears was his from everlasting years. But a new glory crowns his brow, and every knee to him shall bow. In closing, the Bible is a revelation revelation of Christ the forgiver. The plot was and is to forgive us. The way is the Bible, the truth is in the Bible, and the life is the Bible, the manifested word of God, Jesus. I'm qualified to share this word only because I stand in a place of the forgiven. As well, I have forgiven some things that I never thought I could but the Holy Ghost has given me that power. Furthermore, please, along with me, remember we the chosen, the royal priesthood, 
have had sins of commission and sins of omission to contend with. The works that God expects us to do, but we don't do them. While a sin of commission is typically observable and often more dramatic, sins of omission can do just as much damage. The sins of omission can lead to sins of commission. The reading of God's word, the staying faithful to church members, paying your tithes, reading the word of God, praying and seeking God, and showing love one for, for one another. In James 14, to bear that out, in case you don't think there are scripture, there is, and there are several. Therefore, to him that knoweth, this is James 4 and 17, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. This word of God has been a blessing to me. I pray that it has been a blessing to you. I'm certain that you enjoy the word of the Lord. So listen, stay tuned. Stay tuned to our YouTube channel. Stay tuned to our Facebook channel for more special events. And remember, the teaching that you heard tonight, along with other great teachings, can be found right here on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. No need to binge anything else. If you want a good word, just come to our channel and feast your soul on the word of the Lord. Listen, also, if you don't have a church home and you live in the Columbus area, feel free to come and worship with us any Sunday or any day. Just tune in to our channels right here on our Facebook page, ccafcolumbus.org. And listen closely because it won't be long before our doors will be wide open for in-person worship. But in the meantime, know that you can get your word here in Jesus' name. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. That's our prayer for you. Have a wonderful rest of the day.